I work at uh, Fampiro, which is a 29-year-old digital foundry that uh, today is focused on OEM and custom type development and typographic research and process development for type and typography. And also, uh, Fampiro is now a much smaller company than it was in the past owing to the founding of Type Network. Type Network is a three-year-old company uh, that represents Font Bureau and many other foundries in the many ways, uh, areas of the type design business between uh, type design itself and the customer. And this allows foundries like Font Bureau and others to concentrate their efforts on their core capabilities uh, while still taking on sometimes jobs that are bigger than any of us can handle by ourselves. Um, I started using this term, uh, I, I come from uh, a modern traditional type background, which uh, sort of means that I work with all the modern tools, but I sort of try to think the way that they did before uh, to get inside the heads of various designers. And I started using this term, and uh, my spell checker was highlighting it like it wasn't a word. And so I looked it up, and it, it, it actually is a word uh, that... Um, refers to a device that can change uh, the parameters of other devices. And so um, if text had variations before type, though, it must have had variators before the devices. So um, we have this history of uh, making things with tools. And in that world of using tools, it's the t tool that's defining a lot of, about the the features of the typeface. The the pen that you use dis determines what the size is until it gets so big that you have to get a brush. And uh, the tiles determine uh, either one or two stem weights for the glyphs. And uh, then... Um, we got into type, and uh, type had variations depending on what it was being made of uh, and who was cutting the punches and variations, all the way to how long pages took to dry as they come off the press. And I once made a long database of all the things that could happen between those, and then all the things that could go wrong, like. Uh, miss striking a punch or something, so that I could start to categorize things that might be wrong in the specimens that I was looking at and not be fooled by a common error that occurs. Um, uh, then there were a few hundred years of, uh, uh, of an industry producing font families uh, is a size or a range of sizes and not often any weights or widths. Um, and you see this uh, in the presentation before. Uh, I think just about every style that he showed was normal, uh, as we would say, or the default font. And I'm sure that there were others, but there weren't very many others. And I think that there are some interesting reasons for that that we can learn today. Um, Jobs formed around this process that involved uh, various parts of uh, getting from the typography that you, the type that you purchased to the pages that you made, uh, including uh, the typographer and the composer and the all-important person who knew where every single piece of type and furniture in the entire office was, uh, which is kind of critical for uh, getting things running uh, well. Uh, and then typesetting machines came and went. Uh, and in the process of doing that, they eliminated uh, the kind of composers that there had been before uh, and replaced it uh, with um, uh, 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 early computers. And when that happened, there was sort of this gap uh, between the, the, the jobs that had existed before and the new jobs. On the, on the far right, you see the wreckage of a 1970s typesetting job. And on the other side of the gap, you see the wreckage of the linotype machines. 
And what happened is a group of companies came in with a new technology, and uh, it was the first massive piracy uh, of, of fonts. Uh, and they made uh, new typesetting systems for people who were using the same fonts before. They were copying the fonts from other vendors that they had made before. So the new users of these early computers didn't really have to know very much about uh, typography. The computer took over the metrics that the typographer had known before, so that as soon as you put in the text, you knew how long things were going to be, and you could adjust and edit uh, and editorialize to get it to the right length uh, without really knowing what font you were using, because most of the people were using fonts that they had been using in the other systems before. So this gap sort of opened the way for a future of um, uh, uh, of what we call today the typographic guru, um, because this gap caused a lot of uh, um, the internal information and the understanding of how various typefaces worked was sort of uh, forgotten a little bit. And um, then there was a decade of uh, digital technology that led from the typesetter being computerized to the front end composition systems being personal computerized, complete with mass market applications and fonts, ending with the, the, uh, the development of Adobe Type Manager and no more Jaggies, which sort of made that, that system on the Macintosh uh, a lot more pleasant for people to use. Uh, but Desktop publishing also cemented a trend of having a single master font scale to all sizes accompanied by some number of italic widths and weights, also capable of use at all sizes. But also inherited from the office was the concept of a default font, which really didn't exist before computers, um, because a computer has to have an answer to every single question in the typographic mantra before it can display anything. I'm sure that some people who used computers in the 80s and 90s found that you could actually crash the system by removing Helvetica, which was the default for things. Uh, it wouldn't complain, it, was just, it would just go down, and you had to know that you had d deleted Helvetica. And I used to periodically delete Helvetica. <laughs> um, I stopped when it didn't work anymore. It, when it didn't crash the machine, it wasn't fun. Um, but that default, uh, sort of, that default font uh, uh, also came along with it, these sort of standard variations of bold italic and bold italic that a lot of software and people, that's as far as they ever needed to go, even if uh, they were just making it beyond monospace fonts into proportional fonts from the office market. They very rarely went beyond uh, Roman italic and bold. And so again, the metrics were pa being passed uh, without a composer or a typographer uh, from the font to the screen uh, and then from the screen to the output device. And all of the widths and heights of things were being figured out. And so into this, um, uh, uh, this first gap was sort of pasted over by font gurus like Roger Black and Eric Speakerman and uh, people who were really interested in both the, uh, uh, the, the uh, type development and the, uh, uh, the typography that came out of it. They were both sort of, uh, the, the guru sort of pasted over this gap and uh, advised people on stuff and found the right fonts for them and uh, knew the internal relationships and things and the color of the type on the page. And these are the things that uh, the gurus did. And then uh, there was a second uh, uh, gap when the web was uh, launched with uh, HTML. Uh, it basically knocked typography back uh, two decades to default fonts. and and uh, the inability for thousands of publications to express themselves in the fonts that they had been using for decades. And this had a very, very profound effect on uh, the, uh, the, 
the publication industry. Uh, newspapers disappeared uh, and magazines disappeared and, and uh, many of the uh, people who had been involved in typography at these publications uh, didn't really have any place to go because uh, the, the uh, internet, uh, in, as it launched, sort of ate all of the money from the newspapers, for example, that were involved in uh, agate type. So the newspapers couldn't keep up with the internet on uh, stock scores or classified ads or sports scores. And those things all went to the web and the newspapers were left with the stuff that you like to read, uh, but not the, uh, the revenue required to support the editorial staff. So there was a, a fundamental um, uh, uh, gap, again, created with the web that slowly had to be built up over another decade to, to where people could get fonts. And into this, uh, people started um, introducing uh, more typographically uh, suited typefaces, like Verdana, for the web, but not really telling anybody that it was an eight-point design or uh, referencing any sort of uh, optical size issues with it. So uh, we had the beginnings of uh, things that made um, type uh, work better on screens, but not the system that told people how that was happening or why. There was the internal guts that said, this is a bigger body and a taller excite and all that stuff. Had to be explained over and over again because there was no information in the font that really helped people with that. So um, uh, there was rather uh, meager font information uh, in the desktop formats uh, that carried on into open types format and then web typography now uses them too, re reintroduced default fonts and limited stylistic variations. Um, all the while, however, the use of the web was expanding its page description to suit a broadening range of typographic needs across a wide range of scripts and portals and resolutions. So at the same time that we were losing a lot of the information that people knew about the fonts that were being used, we were broadening the scope of people who were using uh, real typography, or trying to at least. Um, so this maintained the gap that was opened in the, with the first computers. And this font info gap combined with several historically large increases in the population of users initially paved the way for these type gurus who knew about typography and print. Um, and then in Font Bureau's initial decade of work, uh, we worked for a lot of the art directors and design directors who were providing this guru service. And um, one of the things that we did a lot of is uh, we made um, uh, optical sizes uh, of fonts for print and, uh, at both ends of the size spectrum. Uh, the, the gurus and the publishers understood ultimately that there were advantages to smaller sizes as far as readability and there were uh, advantages to larger sizes in, in terms of the economy of space that they used. <clears throat> and. Uh, so um, this is an example of one of those typefaces. We did a deal with Linotype while it was still an independent company where we would develop this as a series of optical sizes. And we ended up doing it uh, as a GX variation font. Um, uh, Tom Rickner and uh, Tobias for Jones and I worked on this for, uh, I don't know, uh, quite a while. Um, and I'll get back to the process of getting from one place to another. But uh, we made the first Apple TrueType fonts, which began our experience with scalable outline fonts that were made primarily for the screen and for use on the screen. Um, uh, when Apple Computer first revealed variations technology, to us at the Font Bureau. We were excited about the typographic possibilities, but also we went along, uh, uh, as we went along sliding the skew weights around, we realized that there was probably something that you could do with animation too. And so we started uh, thinking about that. Um, to, 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 at, at the time, there were a lot of uh, funny little 
people dancing on the web because they had gotten a better insurance rate or something, or uh, these little GIF uh, movies that were going on uh, that people called, uh, I don't know what they call them today, but back then at the beginning of the internet, everyone called it dancing baloney. And uh, I thought that if you could, you could uh, make it easier for people to make dancing baloney, there would be a lot more dancing baloney. And uh, um, uh, so that uh, 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 development with Skia um, couldn't help but catch our eyes with the animation possibilities. And in fact, history repeated itself when variations came out this time, and a lot of people saw type moving around, and what they wanted to do was to make type move around. Um, my primary interest is not in animations, and I'm glad that there are a lot of people who are interested in that. Um, but at the time, I felt that typography, the actual quality of typography, uh, needed a shot in the arm. As uh, uh, the underwear guys showed yesterday, there's this, there's this I, I think it's an imagined uh, loss of quality in typography that's really the result of an immense growth in the population of people who are using really fun, really, really, uh, really real, typo real typefaces. And um, so what you get is basically that everybody that used a typewriter uh, 50 years ago is now using real type and everyone who was using a typesetter 50 years ago is also using real type. And so you have a broader range on the same platform, but I don't think that the quality at the high end has suffered uh, as much as people show in their diagrams. And so, I mean, if you're worried about the quality at the low end, there are a, a very limited number of ways of, uh, of helping people with that, with the, the scarcity of data inside the fonts. You you need to guru on a massive scale. So uh, leaving animation and world scripts behind, which I think is a very important uh, part of, uh, of um, discussions of the advantages of variations. I think that those are equally important to the things that, that I, I work on. But uh, there's a limited amount of things that you can do. Uh, variations is a gigantic uh, uh, place uh, where you can find stuff. Um, the technology didn't flourish, but I went on using it for another six years uh, until um, there, it was almost impossible to run uh, OS 9 and OS 10. Uh, and um, in, uh, in most of that time, I had spent trying very hard to make a seven axis um, uh, GX variable, and I just didn't get it. Uh, there was something that I was missing. Um, but uh, I, I, I took that seven axis variable font and sort of navigated my way to a variety of designs, and Moderno and Giza and a couple of other uh, custom fonts came out of that one uh, GX font. Um, and also we, we worked on uh, uh, Premiere, uh, for Premier Magazine, we did the El Dorado as a uh, GX variation font. And, uh, and also, I did Throwhand as a GX variation font. And this was uh, an extremely difficult process because in the end, you had to convert them over to PostScript files, uh, fonts. And then you had a lot of work to get them to work as PostScript files. So for example, you see the Z in G Giza is self-intersecting. And in GX variations, as it is today, in open type variations, that was fine. But in uh, going from a GX variations font to a PostScript font, that would leave little holes uh, because PostScript has this bug uh, that they've admitted it was a bug, that if you took two black shapes and put them on top of each other, in other words, opacity plus opacity does not equal transparency. <laughs> it, it equals double opacity. Uh, so this, this bug uh, really prevented typography from leaving metal type. Metal type and photographic type says that you have a continuous lines going around and they don't intersect each other. And, and render, rendering software goes nuts if that happens. And so this, this ability to have shapes that are overlapping each other, which is really important in digital media, uh, was not really 
possible until, uh, until GX variations and everyone agreed that overlapping shapes were allowed. Whether or not the technology that's out there is going to be able to be updated is, I think it's only got about 1% chance. But we'll see how that works. <laughs> Most people uh, uh, know nothing much happened until uh, 2014, and then um, uh, uh, and, uh, I think Google got the idea that this is a compression technology, and so they started uh, um, becoming interested in it, and uh, we ended up with these four companies forming a, uh, an alliance uh, with uh, Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, and Google, who published a specification uh, shortly after ATAP Pi in Poland and then asked for comments afterwards and more input. So um, starting in the summer of uh, 2016, uh, Fabio did uh, two explore, uh, exploratory developments um, with the possibilities both among and beyond the registered axes. Um, I had run into this problem of getting beyond the registered axes before, and this time I was asked to go way beyond it. I, I was asked to, to make as many axes as I could uh, to demonstrate the breadth of things that you could do with uh, variation fonts. And uh, so these... Uh, Two different fonts evolved out of this. Originally, Google wanted me to make three, and then uh, for budgetary concerns, after I had figured out what axes I would put in a serif and a sans and a decorative face, they said, well, there's only one font now. Uh, can you put them all in one font? And uh, I said no. <laughs> uh, but uh, we can cut down the number of glyphs because the number of glyphs that we're trying to make to demonstrate these things is not really the most important thing. So we were able to cut down the uh, number of glyphs and then keep it at uh, two fonts. Um, and one of them wa was Amstelvar, which was intended as a uh, sort of workhorse serif typeface that uh, could demonstrate something that hadn't really existed before, which was a very large optical size range in a single typeface family. As you've seen in a lot of slides before, uh, before me, uh, optical sizes in the past usually covered a fairly small range that w was possible for one machine to do. And uh, the, the size range of typography was broken up from machine to machine until you got to something too big for anything but a person with a brush. And so that meant that there were, v and there are very few examples of big optical size ranges and typefaces. And you, as you've see, seen from the, 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 uh, um, the presentation of the Intel Italian types, it's important to get as much information about these things as you can so you can learn what it was that they were doing to various uh, styles of type to make them work at different sizes because it's not just, you don't apply the same uh, ideas to serif and sans serif. Uh, 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 and I'll get to that in a second. And the other typeface was Decovar, which just, is just a very fun, it started out as <laughs> a very fun uh, exercise. And then it became clear to me that there was a really bad relationship between variable fonts and composite parts. So each of, of the elements of Decovar is a quadratic outline with four sides, and they're bundled into these groups of four, uh, four quad, uh, uh, quadrilaterals uh, that, that split up the parts of the letter according to um, uh, what it's, it's it does in the letter, whether it's the beginning or end of things or a main thing or, uh, or, or a connection. The, they each had their own parts and uh, then I could, um, I could manipulate those parts individually. But uh, the, the, uh, 
uh, the, the parts were all um, re uh, uh, were all uh, composites that were referencing each other, and it turned out that that just got to be too complicated. And in the end, we went, when we went and you know, and you've got uh, eleven axes, and each character has twenty four contours, and you're trying to keep them all in order. Uh, it gets to be um, uh, practically impossible, and I, I, I ended up with these huge clouds of points. Uh, that taught me what it was like to work on kanji, um, where you you really can't um, get in and edit everything. It's very difficult to select things even once you put these things together, which is why I had originally done it with composites. Uh, things happened in that uh, development, and I confess, my first confession, <laughs> It was a mistake to combine parametric and blended axes in a font. Even if we were just trying to demonstrate things to the alliance themselves to get other people in, at the companies that were involved excited about this, it, it really confused people because uh, it meant that you could navigate with the sliders to places that didn't work, which is not typical of a font family. Typically, every single instance of a font family is you know, perfectly uh, the same as the default quality. So your, your, your bold and your regular don't suffer any change. Uh, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, what we ended up with was uh, um, a font that I uh, had uh, blended things out of, but there's a sort of a, uh, an implementation issue, issue that makes it very... Uh, it makes it problematic to get out of the pit where the ax registered axes exist uh, without doing something uh, like I, what I did with uh, with uh, Amstelbar. And here you see in the above line the actual optical size axis of Amstelbar, and the bottom line is well, all you can do in the data to represent what's going in there. And I think it's interesting because the metrics that I was talking about that fell into the, I mean, that crossed the gap, the metrics are all being accurately translated across from one font to another, but the internal relationships of stuff has disappeared. And you can see, uh, because I can navigate uh, among my parametric axes from the actual images in the top to what the data actually shows, uh, you can see that the metrics of the glyphs are coming across uh, because those are in the, in the glyphs of the fonts that are produced, but the internal things are just not being shown. So um, by defining parametric axis where only one kind of parametric is being adjusted, as most of Amstelvar's axis are, I can, do, I can make a font that just got parametric axes and the user can navigate to the place they want, or I can make a font with blended uh, or registered axes as they are, but if you mix them together, you have to have some kind of an understanding between those two things that doesn't really exist in the format. Um, uh, so with the, uh, the parametric version, if you can build a user interface onto that that defines these other axes or add some uh, JavaScript or something to it, then you can sort of get the best of both worlds. So that's what we're working on reali uh, r realizing fairly soon. Um, so one doesn't have to leave the open type specification to get all the power that we're talking about, but you have to leave the registered axes. And there's a couple other reasons for that involving the value systems and the, the incredibly stringent defaults of those uh, registered axes that makes it so that they're not really typographically valued. I mean, OS2 values are not a typographic value. And um, knowing what the relationship of the width of the extremes are to the regular and percentages doesn't really allow you to relate that font to any other font. So my uh, interest in parametric axes comes from the fact that they are using parametric values, which are thousands of an M. And once you have something that is expressed as a part of an M, then the rest of the software that has to do with typography that uses the M uh, is dovetailed with your parametric axes. And this doesn't happen with the, the, the uh, registered axes because they don't have parametric values. So the relationship between two regulars is unknown. And the only way that you can find out is by looking at them. And I'm not saying that looking at them isn't a 
uh, a difficult thing to do for a guru, but looking at two different typefaces for an average person to figure out how they relate to each other can be a little bit challenging. So um, here I show uh, something between the use of registered and parametric axis where Amstelvar is being set at a range of optical sizes and then uh, the value of the parametric axis controlling the contrast is adjusted for the deviation demanded by the or orthogonal open type implementation and then uh, going through this d deviation to a real parametric value, I can keep the hairline, as you see on the left, this is actual size and the right is blown up, but you can see that the hairline is being kept at a, a consistent value from one size to another. So it's one point at 36 point, and it's one point at 24 point, and it's one point at 18 point. And uh, this is a way of saving the dedones because you can't really use a dedo on the web with fine hairlines. Uh, I've, I've tried to talk several uh, publications into it and they just, they, they're going from a dedo to a slab uh, because that's the thing that most looks like the dedo. Um, so, uh, I can, I, can, I can manipulate this and I can put this into software so that a user using uh, the optical size axis can then change the, the, the hairlines to whatever they wish and not endanger the type. And this was just a little quick exercise uh, where I show the kind of interaction you get in the typography because the parametric axes are expressed in per mil values, which is, this, which is uh, the parts of M's and the typography is working in M's. So if you know how much uh, of an M is between two lines, then I can say uh, at this particular size, I want the slab serifs to be the same value as the space between the lines, uh, which would be hard to do other than visually otherwise. And then the other thing I'm doing here is I'm justifying using the X, uh, uh, what's called an X transparency axis that doesn't change anything except for the width so that uh, just about um, uh, any character or word uh, or line that you want to change the length of, you can change the length of without making it appear that there's too much of a change in the font. So you can see that the Ds at the end of the first two lines aren't exactly the same uh, Ds, um, but I, don't, I think that there's a small enough difference so that somebody would, <coughs> would, would not recognize that. And also there's a long history of justified uh, inscriptional carvings where this stuff happens too. Uh, and so I think it's something that people could get used to. What I don't think they could get used to is that cue. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think people set every sentence as a panogram. So uh, the, the existence of cues is, is not so bad. But I could also make a cue, an alternate cue that just had a baseline bar. And you know, those kinds of things are, 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 are what uh, you want to be able to bring into the typography without the user ever having to do anything about it. So as the, li the, the line spacing reduces to a certain point, your, your, uh, your descending uppercase characters have to go to some variation space to get the right glyph or version of that glyph. And I think that we saw some of that in the Italian typefaces before that we were looking at there are nine versions of certain characters. And it's not just the descenders. There's other stuff going on here. Um, so the other thing that is uh, very valuable that people have been asking me for is, uh, is to be able to use parametric axes to map from the use of one font to another uh, and get something that resembles uh, a starting point for rededicating uh, your stylistic selection of some styles. Uh, so uh, I had uh, uh, Amstelvar already with an optical size axis and a uh, parametric weight and a parametric width axis. And I composed the stuff on the uh, left uh, using those axes, and then I, uh, I was kind of missing a sans serif, so I spent most of August drawing about a thousand characters to make uh, the font on the right, which is called Adsworth, which only has 
uh, from what I learned about Amstelar, it only has three axes. It has an optical size axis, it has a parametric width axis, and a parametric weight axis. And that allows you to get to all of the variations that were in Amstelvar that don't have to do with alignments. A lot of what Amstelvar is, is uh, trying to demonstrate is that interoperable uh, scripts uh, really are going to require independently operable vertical metrics so that they can match and you won't have to like make a separate font for where the uh, the Latin's been changed for the Chinese versus a Chinese font where the Latin is uh, uh, the, or, you know you don't have to make two fonts like Source Sans has and other uh, other products are just repeating this gigantic character set just for a one or two parametric changes and I think that's kind of a waste of space but in any case uh, what I did then was I, I, I took the uh, font, uh, the Asworth font, and I set it to the same parametric values uh, that I had and the optical sizes that I had for uh, the, the composition in Amstelvar, and the result is it's not exactly the same to any two people, uh, which is an interesting issue uh, to, to determine what exactly makes things look the same. Uh, if you don't have to do that because you've got the parametric values and people can, especially on the web, people can sort of trim and, and tuck here and there and, and uh, fine tune the instances that they want to use. And this isn't just for changing from one font family to another. You then could mix the various sizes uh, of the regular and the italic here and have um, all your optical sizes and widths and weights be interchangeable between the serif and the sans serif face. So that's what Adsworth was and uh, here are a few of the, uh, the uh, a few images of the axes. Uh, this is the great axis that uh, has um, a few other interesting things about it I'll skip forward to because I'm over time. Um, uh, this, so this font has the three axes that, that as I went around uh, being yelled at by various people, <laughs> uh, I learned that they were the most important uh, axes that uh, users want specifically on the web. Uh, and that's, that, that uh, makes it so that you have a, a, sort of the best of both worlds. You have three simple programmable axes that can give you all of the styles that you need. And one of the things that I found interesting about that is that I've got a lot of interest from people for tabular figures in variation space. And if you imagine a very, uh, what I call a mighty weight axis that goes from very, very thin to very, very f uh, black, being confined to a single uh, width across them, uh, you, you, you can't really go as far as you need to in the weight axis and keep them on, on uh, uh, tabular widths. Um, and the options are that you break up the weight axis into various tabular widths and hope that the user doesn't ask for a weight over here and a weight over there where the tabular widths have changed. Well, the, the, after thinking about this and almost breaking my brain trying to figure out how to do it, I suddenly realized that all you have to do is give people tabular figures and a grade axis, and anywhere they are in the design space, they can have as many tabular figure weights as they need. So I think that that's like a change in the way uh, uh, applications and people uh, uh, access tabular figures that really isn't accounted for anywhere, but we're going to have to figure it out uh, either as a group or as me as a group. So, I mean, this sort of brings up, I've been asking this question now for three years, how did people do good, great typography between uh, before OS2 values? They did, we know that. And we know that they didn't have OS2 values until IBM requested them in the middle 80s. So we're now talking about a 30-year-old technology that was made for something completely different, that is putting a fairly large damper on the things that you can do with typography with variations. Uh, and this is how I uh, visualize it. Uh, because uh, I have thousands of electrical parts at my house. I don't know. 
if everybody does, but uh, these are some of the electrical parts that I've correct, collected in, in uh, boxes in my house. And this, the one on the left is sort of what we've got. It's a very simple set of connections. Uh, but it's supposedly for, to set the values of all scripts. And what I really need is the thing on the right, with a, which is a small number of parametric values for each script. Um, and I, I, I don't see movement toward that, so we're going to have to see what happens. Um, and also, I think that these parametric uh, values are extremely important and much more valuable to us than OS2 values for doing some of the research I'm going on to do when I get home, which is how to uh, how do you control these values for responsive typography and responsive design. And then there's the question of how you get the lizard into the guy's mouth in, uh, in uh, VR space, uh, where there's a whole other interesting set of issues uh, involved with the fact that uh, a user can be at any angle to the type, um, or, or the type can follow the user around and be normal. Uh, for example, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues with uh, things that are like wayfinding and the way that wayfinding changes in, variation, in uh, virtual space. But virtual space is very interesting to me because you take this little screen, not in this case, I don't think, but not in this hardware, but most of the cheaper hardware, is that you take your, your phone and you cut it in half and you put it really close to your eyes, and then you have a space that's as big as this room that's, you know, these little things pasted all over the place, uh, these little goggle things have taken over the space. So instead of working with a desktop that's like tiny, you suddenly have this gigantic space to work in. And when they figure out the high resolution solutions to that, it's going to be an interesting change in the way people work uh, with uh, type, I think. Uh, not just having it there, but actually working with gestural things and speech. I have tried to use a typewriter in virtual space and it's it's like the craziest thing you ever heard of uh, but I started to get sick and then we had to I started to decide that there were there had to be other ways of doing this so that's what I got thanks so much <laughs>